just looking at what's happening in our world nation. And the message is called Battling the Spirit of Antichrist. Battling the Spirit of Antichrist. Does everybody turn to Psalm 9? Somebody got that page number? 497. If you're in the blue book, it's 497. Psalm chapter 9. 497 in the blue book. Actually, We're going to remember that The Bible says in the New Testament, that, talking about the Old Testament, that all these things were written for our example. And a lot of times, remember, we have to put, we have to take a physical story and give it a, and, and look at it through spiritual eyes. That's what Jesus did with the, all of the parables. They were all physical stories about seeds and rocks and birds, but every one of them had a very spiritual message. So let's look at Psalm 9. Go to verse 13. Page 498. 498. Psalm 9, verse 13. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. O you lift me up from the gates of death, that I may recount all your praises, that in the gates of the daughter of Zion I may rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk in the pit that they have dug. In the net that they hid, their own foot has been caught. The Lord has made known himself. He has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. And then it says, Selah. Right? Most of your Bibles have Selah. And we know what Selah means. Selah means to meditate on this. And, it, and the actual exact meaning is a cow standing in the field eating grass and the cow has several stomachs and it swallows the grass and it keeps it there for a while and later on it brings it back up and it chews it again because there's a lot more to get out of it that's the word here so what we just read he says sit down and meditate and think about what you just read that there are people that hate you okay the church does seem to understand that there are people that hate us. Why? Because of Christ. Okay? Always has been, always will be. There are, it says the nations have dug a what? Pit. A pit. What's a pit for? To trap, hmm? to, trap to trap you. And when you trap something in a pit, the person in the pit don't have a good outcome, right? It says it's also laid a net for you. Why, why are nets laid? Same thing. So the nations are trying to trap us. And these, these are those who hate us. Okay, let's go to verse 17. The wicked shall return to hell, and all the nations that forget God. Wow. The Bible says that a nation that forgets God, what happens to it? It turns to hell. God, we turn into hell. We're not. Because we're in a different kingdom. Right. But... This nation, has this nation forgot God? You better believe it. Abraham Lincoln warned about it that many years ago. We so far from what he saw, so we're seeing what we are reaping. The nation is reaping, I'm going to quit saying we. The nation is reaping what it has sown. Look what it says right here. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord. Let not man prevail. Okay? Man is trying to prevail in this earth. Man is trying to rule. Okay? Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are what? But men. Lord, let them know what they are. You know, it's like in Psalm 2. If you ever read my little black book, Why Do the Nations Rage? If you haven't, I got a, some copies. You know, it says that the, the kings of the earth and the, and the rulers are getting together and they're conspiring against the Lord and His anointed one. And they're saying, we're going to cut your cords from us. You ain't ruling us no more, God. You and, and your Christ. And it says, the next verse says, He who sits in the heavens 
laughs. So God thinks about them. And he will hold them in his derision. That means it will be good for them. Amen? Amen? Again, it says, Selah. And then look how it, it ends in verse 20. Somebody read the end of verse 20 for me. To put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are but men. One more. Read the next line. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? All right. This guy that's proclaiming all this truth sometimes feels like us. Why, oh God, are you standing far away from us? Why are you hiding yourself from what's going on? Why are you allowing all this to happen? Right? That's how he felt. That's how we feel if we're, at, if, or if we're honest, right? A lot of times. But we, get, we, need to, we need to not go by what we feel and we got to go by what we know is faith. Amen? But all I'm saying is it's human to feel this way. As a matter of fact, the very last one in verse... Uh, Okay, we're going to see. Let's go to, verse, let's go to uh, Psalm 10. Flip a page. Psalm 10, verse 1. We there? It says, In arrogance the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boast of the desires of his souls, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. As for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved throughout all generations. I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing, deceit, and oppression. Under his tongue of mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages and hiding places. He murders the innocents. He's, he's, his eyes... Stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in the thicket. He lurks at, that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him in his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will not see it. Arise, O Lord. Lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. So we see in verse 1 that the, the, the arrogant, the wicked, they have schemes. That they have devised. What's the scheme? A wicked plan. I want to tell you something right now. What's the biggest news on TV right now? Uh -huh. Afghanistan. 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 Ain't cold. But that's the, 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 the newest one is Afghanistan. Afghanistan has kicked COVID off the news, which has kicked the southern border off the news where they let millions of, of, of illegal immigrants into our country. There's so many schemes going on, we can't keep up with them. But I'll tell you something, this, this, this what's happening in Afghanistan, one of our presidents you know, a long time ago said, there's nothing that happens in government that is not planned. Amen. If you think they allowed Sleepy Joe, old Crazy Joe Biden, to do something in Afghanistan without being told this is what you can do, then you, you, you really could just watch CNN and believe it. Because nothing is happening that is not planned. I don't know what they're planning, but they got a, they are, they have screwed up NATO completely. They are, they have, we have Americans trapped behind enemy lines by the thousands. They don't even know who, how many they are. They're saying go to the airport. Now, they're, they're saying you can't go to the airport. My next door neighbor, his younger brother, is a lieutenant colonel in the, in, the, in the military. He's retired. He lives in Colombia now. He had, a, he, had a, he had a translator in Afghanistan. And he sent me and a couple guys pictures of him with them. And they're texting over the last two weeks. It's the fear of, for him and his family. Friday night, Douglas texted us and he said he just went out and shot himself. That's the kind of demonic deals that we, and, and, and men just worry about photoshops and what, how it looks on the news. The enemy has schemes. Look what it says, the wicked boast. They are greedy and they gain curses. 
They crush the deceit the, and deceit and oppression. They ambush. They 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 finding places. They murder the innocent. Murder, Mike? Come on, man. I want you to read when you get a chance. Read Romans chapter one. Read Romans chapter one, where it says they say there is no God, and they purposely put God out of their their, their mindset. And then it says the next step is sexual immorality comes in. And it says it just like it just like it says it. Men will lie with men and women with women, which is an abomination before the Lord. And now you got churches that are saying, you know what, that's really not a big deal anymore. Right. So I, again, I don't know what book they read, but it ain't this book. It ain't this book. Because this book is crystal clear in the Old and New Testament. And what happens after that? It says God gives them over to a de a depraved, a debased mind. Their mind becomes seared with a hot iron. So when your mind is seared, it's no longer penetrable. And you look at the you look at the further characteristics of those people, and one of them is murder. Let me tell you something. Somebody who can advocate the murder of a little bitty baby in his mother's womb won't think twice about killing you. I'll say that again. Yeah, I heard Those it. who advocate the killing of an innocent baby right. in his mother's womb won't have a problem of killing you. That's true. And we have church pastors that are voting for people who advocate the killing of babies. Church pastors in Lafayette that I know of. Let's go to uh, the book of Daniel. Chapter 7. We're kind of going to go out of line of the little thing. Daniel chapter 7. There's a guy on uh, YouTube. His name is uh, Matt Baker. Matt Baker, he spoke before the San Diego uh, Commission of uh, whatever. And so just Google Matt Baker, San Diego. And if you think I'm intense, this dude, but I, I, I thought it was like he's Elijah the prophet standing in front of these people, man. Uh, and I'm, you know. Anyway, we're in some, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel is a very, very <coughs> uh, clear description of the end times. Daniel and Revelation coincided so much. Look at, verse, look at chapter 7. Look at verse 17. He's talking about the beast. Now remember, when you say a beast in the Bible, you're not talking about a bear running around, okay, or a leopard. Sometimes they'll say it looked like a bear, it was like a leopard, it was like a lion, okay. Beasts are kingdoms, okay. Most of the time, women are religions, okay. So when you have a woman riding the beast, this is not Katy Perry at the halftime show, but she was. She was a woman riding the beast, right out of Revelation. But it's a religious system riding a government system. And they've always worked together. They work together against Jesus. They work together against Paul. And we're going to see them working together in the end times. So look at verse 17. These four beasts, great beasts, are four what? Kings. Kings. Who shall arise where? Out of the earth. Out of the earth. They're people, right? They're people. Okay. But the saints of the Most High, who's that? Us. us. Say that again. Who's that? Us. That's us? Who says that's me? That's me. That's me. Okay, I want you to remember that's us now. Okay? So it says, that the, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. How many like verse 21? I like it. I like it. I mean, verse 18. We're not going to like 21. Okay. As I looked, this horn, now remember, a horn on a beast is a sim symbol of power. Like a, a horn on a cow, you don't want to get between a horn on a cow, right? That's a symbol of power. The horn on this beast, it made war with the saints. Now, we just said the saints was us, right? Right. Nobody wants to be the saints anymore. And prevailed over them until, say until, until, until the ancient of days. Who's that? Jesus. 
That's God. That's Jesus. Came and the judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Now this horn, he shall speak words against the Most High. And he shall wear out the saints. Who's the saints? Us. Okay, so verse 21 and 22 says that this beast is going to make war with us and will wear us out. I can see how, how many of you kind of feel worn out with what's going on right now? Okay, because it's, it's the pressures of these things that we can just feel, okay? And he, this horn will think to ch change times in the law, and th they shall be given into his hand for a times and a half a time. A time, a times, and a half a time. Okay, a time is a year. Okay, in the Bible. So a time, look at me right here. A time is a year. A times means more than one is how many? Two. So how many we got right now? Three. And a half a time. So three and a half. So you look at, so the Bible says for three and a half years, Revelation says 42 months. Guess what? That equals the same thing. It even 1260 days, same thing. For three and a half years, this Antichrist, this, this beast, will rule over and wear out us. That's what it says. Look at verse 27. We're going to get to another good scripture that we're going to want to amen. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Can we say amen again? Amen. See, the problem is, and like churches, how many of you ever heard a sermon on 21 and 22 about the, the beast wearing you out and triumphing? I prosperity gospel. No, you're not going to hear it. See, because we love verses 21 and, tw and 18 and 27, but we don't like 21 and 22. See, I, I know what I call that? I call that Piccadilly Christians. And I call that Piccadilly churches. To where all you preach is the good things. But we got to be, we got to see law. We got to meditate on what the Bible tells us we need to know. But we need to know that even if we're worn down, even if we've made war against, it's only until, it's only until the, the Ancient of Days comes and says, you know what? Now it's time. Now I'm coming in. Now I'm going to give the, the judgment. And the saints get, I'm not talking about the only saints either. I'm talking about the saints get the kingdom. For how long? Forever and ever and ever. And look what it says about the people. It says, and the kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom. And all the dominion shall serve and obey him. Everybody. Amen? Yeah. Alright, let's go to the back of the, the uh, New Testament <coughs> to 1 John. Right before Revelation. 11.23 in the blue book. Dana's not turning that fast. I gave him some cheat notes. That's all. He wants to go to 1 John chapter 2. Yeah, I, I didn't write it on your little uh, notes. I, I did. We're going to verse 15. But it's chapter 2, verse 15. What are we talking about today? Battling the spirit of Antichrist. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. For anyone, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So we see the world and we see God. Are they on the same team? No. no, they're not. And why do we play like they are? Why do we play like we are the world is on the same side as God? The church plays it too. The world is an enemy of God. Because the devil is the God of this world, tells us. So we need to, we need to open our eyes and see who the enemy is. You can't fight a battle if you don't even know who your enemy is. Amen? So, boy said, look at verse 16. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides, how long? Forever. Forever. There's that kingdom again. Okay? Now look at this. Verse 18. Children, 
It is the last hour. Now John's writing this 2,000 years ago. Children is the last hour. The last hour just means for men after Jesus came, we're in the last hour now. It is the last hour. As you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. See that? Is that singular or plural? Antichrist. Singular. Single. Huh? Right here is singular. So we know that an Antichrist is coming. Now this is very important. The word Antichrist in the Greek not only mean, you know, when I was young, there was a show called The Omen, and it was the Antichrist, and it was some scary looking, you know, sketchy dude that was just epitome of evil. But the Bible says that the that the, the devil comes how? As an angel of light. As an angel of light. It says, don't be surprised that his service will come that same way too. Right. In the book of Revelation, he describes him like this. He has the appearance of a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. Okay? He parades as a lamb, but he's really a dragon. Paul talks about wolves and what? Sheep's clothes. Sheep's clothes. And where are they? They're in the church, Paul said. They're in the church. Okay? We don't ever seem to look for these people, but they're there. Okay? So we have this picture of uh, the, the, the Antichrist. And what I was getting at in the, in, the, in, the, in the Greek, the word Antichrist not only means against Christ, but it means in place of. Okay? All you got to do, listen, Blue Letter Bible, blueletterbible.com. It, it's a, so easy to work. It comes up, and you put, you'll put in 1 John chapter 18. It'll give you the whole verse, and it'll just it'll highlight every word. You click on that word, and it'll give you the Greek for that word. And it'll say, uh, Antichrist, it means against and in place of. So not only is the Antichrist against Christ, but he comes in place of Christ. You know, they got some re Christian religion, what they call Christian, on this earth, that call their leaders the vicar of Christ. Mm -hmm. That means they are in Christ's place. Mm -hmm. So when you look at me, you're looking at God, they say. They actually have said that. And they give themselves God's name. Jesus prayed in John 17, he said, Holy Father, okay? Well, Jesus said, call no man on earth father, for one is your father in heaven. Well, do we have religious systems that call men father? Yes. Yeah, we do. Okay. We got, and, and, and I'll take it further, we got religious <coughs> we call men reverend. I'm like, look up the word reverend in the Bible. That means to, when you reverend something, you reverence it. What happened when he did that in front of Peter? What did he say? Get up. Don't do that. What happened when John fell before the angel in Revelation? He said, oh no, don't do that. Don't pile down to me. Okay? When you put a title in front of your name, be careful. There's not one title, if anybody, any preachers out there, there's not one title in the entire New Testament. Not one. Not one. Show me one. You can't. You'll, you'll see a function. Apostles, prophets, Preachers, teachers, evangelists. Those are all offices. Okay? But they're not titles. They put them in a backing name in a small letter. It, it, it never was, oh, look, the Apostle Paul is coming with a capital A. It was, I'm Paul, an apostle. And by the way, all that means is I'm going to suffer a lot more than you. Okay? Jesus said, I'm going to show you what it means to be great in my kingdom. And he got on his knees. And what did he do? Took off his robe and started washing their dirty feet. That was the last thing he did before he left. Kind of showed him a picture. All right, let's get back to this. So it says, it is the, as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many, many Antichrists have come. Have come where? Help me out here. In the church? In the, well, we're going to see they came out of the church. But they're in the world, right? It says many Antichrists have come. So there's a lot of antichrists out there. Therefore, we know it is the last hour. Look what, look what John says. They went out from us. They came out of the church. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. So we know that antichrist, and how many are there? Are there is there just one? There's going to be one big dog, but there's a lot of antichrists in the world. And are they spiritual demons floating around, or are they men? They're men. 
Because they came out of the church. Okay? Paul's identi John's identifying them right now. Okay? But look at this. But they went out that it might become plain they, that they are not of us. Look at verse 20. This is an amen scripture. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have knowledge. Somebody read that in your Bible for me. 20. But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. That's King James. Oh, give me another one. But that, that's, you have an unction from the Holy Spirit. What's an unction? What's an unction? The power to function. <laughs> the power to function. That's awesome. Give me somebody else's version. 20. <coughs> Come on, y'all. You missed somebody Mine else's version. Mine says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. Okay. Anybody else anything but knowledge? <coughs> Truth. Truth. Okay, the Bible says, but. So there's antichrists who are in place of Christ, masquerading as Christ or as Christians, saying, I speak for God. Let me tell you something. When a religious leader tells you he speaks for God, be very, very careful. What I'm saying is speaking for God, okay? Which which religious leaders can do? Jim Jones did it. He basically says, "When I speak, God's speaking." Okay? They have religiously. When religious tells you, "Listen to me," don't. I had a religious leader tell me that's very well known. If you want to know who it is, I'll tell you after the service. And he told me that he was driving the bus that the church was on. And nobody in the bus could see where we were going. And he told me, he said, Mike, if you think you can hear from God for yourself, then you've become your own pope. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, I left the church that I needed a pope. He told somebody else that I was a, like an ox in the field with a muzzle on and that I wouldn't let him muzzle me. And so I couldn't be used for the kingdom. Uh, uh, that's some scary stuff. You know, when you drive, I said, you know, any man is driving the bus I'm on, I'm getting off. Because I know what the Bible says about man. Cursed is the man who trusteth in man. What man is that? Any man. That includes Mike Fugilet. I tell people all the time, be a Berean. Search the scriptures. Make sure what I'm telling you is true. If you've got a doubt, ask me. And if you show me in the word, I'm changing my view tomorrow. And I will say I was wrong. Okay? We need to be like that. We need to be Berean because we're all learning. We're all, we are to encourage one another. We are to rebuke one another. We are to teach one another. Amen. Change we are to confess our faults to one another. Change it today. Don't wait till tomorrow. You might forget to change it. Change it today. Yeah, as soon as. You're right. Don't wait till tomorrow. Let's pick this back up. So we know that we have been anointed by the Holy Spirit. And it says, and you have knowledge. And you have truth. Okay. That's what the word says about you. That we are not going to be deceived by this antichrist. Because why? Help me out here. Because we have the Holy Spirit. He has the unction of the function of the truth in us. And he's going to tell you when you hear something or see something. That ain't me. That ain't of God. That's demonic. I don't care if it looks like a sheep. But it may have a wolf. It may be a wolf inside. I don't care if it looks like light. But it's really a spirit of darkness because that's how the Bible tells us they will come. We need to have the function and the unction of the Holy Spirit to know the truth. All right? And then it says this. I write to you because you... I, I don't write to you because you don't know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of the truth. But who is a liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. So who's an antichrist? He denies the Father and the Son. Who's the Son? Jesus. Okay, so you have religious leading, leaders getting together with Muslim leaders, mm. and mother, Muslim leaders say this, Allah is God, and He has no Son. Is Allah the true God? Okay, so how, you have a religious leader teaming up with somebody who the Bible says is antichrist. Do, do, do they read the book? Apparently not. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Say that with me. No one who denies the Son has the Father. 
Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Amen. All right. Genesis 3. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. Because we're going to go on to... to uh, but Genesis 3 is talking about now the servant, the serpent. Who is the serpent? The devil. The devil. He was more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God, I'm in Genesis 3, chapter 1. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Did God say anything about touching it? No. No. So we see the devil coming, and we talk about this often. We talk about the devil coming to Eve, and what is his first scheme? To do what? To, to doubt, to have her doubt what God really said. Okay. Did God really say Okay, so that's the first time. And then we see Eve telling him what God says and then adding stuff. Okay? The Bible says don't add or don't take away from the word. Don't add or don't take away from the word. Okay? So many times I hear a message on, on uh, I don't listen to that anymore. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I've been in my Bible because some of the, so much stuff out there is like, Somebody will they'll, they'll use one scripture and then for the last next 30 minutes they're just talking about stuff. And it's all opinion. And it's like, you know, we've been talking about the word since we started, right? Okay? And if I have an opinion, I'm going to tell you it's my opinion, but it's going to be based on, and I want you to ever, look, raise your hand and say, Mike, what did you say right there? That's not lining up with what we just read. Believe me, I want you to do that. Because I preach, when I have a message like this, I preach this to me three times. Okay? Before I ever bring it to you. This is for me first and foremost. So it says right here that then, then she starts adding stuff and and, 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 God, and, you shall, and then the serpent said to the woman, verse 4, you will not die for God knows when you eat it your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he brought doubt and then he brought, then he brought a bald faced lie. Right? Mm -hmm. Somebody read verse 15 for me. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, when God found out what had happened, he went to Adam and said, What happened, Adam? Who did Adam blame? The woman, the woman you gave me. Who did, who did uh, Eve blame? Devil. That snake. Everybody's blaming everybody else. So God's, God punished everybody, right? Man, you're going to have to sweat. I was sweating yesterday, man. That's from the curse. Of the woman, no. <laughs> From that snake, right? But he said, woman, you're going to be painful and childbearing, okay? And those are just things that we know right off. It's just the curse is in the earth, right? But he told the devil, read that again for me, what you just read. This is, this, is, this is the curse God placed on the devil. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Who is the he that is the offspring of the woman? That's going to that's gonna fight the devil. Who is he? Jesus. Jesus Christ, son of man. Call himself son of man. He will, he said, you're going to bruise his, he said, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and his offspring. That's an interesting thought, that the devil has offspring. You know, I, I really, I've never really heard a clear teaching on that. Who, who is the devil's offspring, or what are the devil's offspring? You know, I know, I know Jesus called the Pharisees, you are of your father, the yeah. devil. You brood of serpents. So, are, are, are there people that are sons of the devil? I don't know. You know, people say the way of Cain. I don't, I don't know, but it, I know that's an interesting scripture. But what I was getting at is this, that the prophecy was that the, the Son of Man, Jesus, will crush your head. Yet yeah, you may deceive, you may have deceived this woman and messed up all mankind, but there's coming one from her who's going to smash your head. 
And you know, we talked about this before. When Jesus was on Golgotha, and the, it said that they would have known they were doing, they never would have crucified the Son of Glory. Because when that cross was stuck in the ground, Golgotha means the skull. And when that cross was stuck in the ground, and that last drop of blood fell, and Jesus said, it is finished, it is paid in full, the devil lost the battle. Amen. His skull was crushed right there at the cross. Amen? Yeah. That was when the prophecy was fulfilled of this. Your head is crushed now. And when you crush a snake's head, he's done. All right, here we go. Let's go to 1 Samuel 16, and we're going to finish up with this. 1 Samuel 16. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at an Old Testament story, and we're going to see the spiritual, what I believe is a very, very characteristic way about battling the Antichrist. Battling the Antichrist. 1 Samuel 16. Come on, Dana, help us out. Oh, uh, page 265 in the book. 265 in the book. All right, 1 Samuel 16, 11. It says, now this is, when, this is when Samuel the prophet is coming to town because God has taken the kingdom away from Saul. Why did he take it away from Saul? First of all, God didn't want the people to have a king. He wanted to be their king, right? right. But the people wanted a king. Let us be like everybody else. Kind of sound like the church, right? Let, we want to be like the world, Lord, so we can influence them. Well, they're influencing us. That are we influenced in them. Okay? So Saul, they, they gave him Saul. You know, this looked like Tom Brady probably. Oh yeah, man, this guy's gonna be great. But what happened? Why did God rip the kingdom from him? Remember? So I got some Bible scholars in here. Why was the kingdom taken away from Saul? He did he disobeyed God. Blatantly. One of the things was God told him to wait for Samuel to come to do a sacrifice before a war. Because he knew when God was there, they won the war. When God wasn't with them, they didn't win the war, right? They knew when they were in some kind of rebellion, they would lose. And all of a sudden, he's waiting. Well, one time he says, go in and kill everything. And I believe that was like when the days of the Nephilim and stuff, there's so much demonic activity that God had to wipe it out because it, it would taint, it would taint everything. And, uh, but, but Saul goes in, what does he do? He keeps the best sheep and the best cows and the best everything and he kept the king alive. And Samuel comes in and he's like, and he says, I did what, you, I did what the Lord instructed us to do. And he's like, What's all what, 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 yeah. what, what am I hearing? Oh, 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 I kept the best for the Lord. And he's like, that's not what the Lord told you to do. In other words, you did what you wanted to do. Amen? And then a further time is, he told, he told him to wait for Samuel to offer the sacrifice to go into battle. And it was getting late. Mm -hmm. And he finally said, you know what? I'm going to do it myself. That's a no-no. Okay? He was not a priest. He could not do that himself. And he did it anyway. And when, that's when Samuel got there. He said, what have you done? He said, well, well, I, I thought, I, I, I. Like, well, you thought wrong. And the kingdom is taken from you and will be given to another. And so God had already picked that person. That person was David, who was a man after God's own heart. So this is when Samuel's coming to town and he tells Jesse, because God told him he's going to be in Jesse's house. Jesse, get your son. We need a, God's picking a king from your sons. And they lined up. They're all lined up except David, because David was a little runt who was in the field, and like he came, he came be part of this selection. So this is where we pick it up, verse eleven. Then Samuel said to Jesse, "Are all your sons here?" And he said, "Oh, there remains one yet, the youngest. But behold, he's keeping the sheep." What that means? What? He's not important, right? Basically, he didn't even what important to bring him. Samuel said to Jesse, "Send and get him." For we will not sit down until he comes. Verse 12. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was a ruddy. He was ruddy. And he had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said. The Lord said. Okay. Who said? 
Lord. The Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Yep. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. He didn't take a little oil in a bottle. He poured oil, a horn of oil, over his head. The picture of the Holy Spirit. And look what happened. In the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So we see right there that, that David is anointed of the Lord. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. we got so many people that are trying to operate without the Spirit of the Lord. Amen? And we talk about how you need the Word and you need the Spirit. You've got to have both. Because if you just have the Word, you're going to be dead. And without the Word, you, the Spirit, you can't, you, you, have no, you have no map. Amen? You need them both. Amen? Uh, verse 18. Somebody read verse 18 for me. One of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. So somebody's talking to They were trying to bring somebody into Saul's camp. This is before. And he says, uh, I know somebody, David. And he describes David. about He's a man of war. He, he, he plays, he's, a, he's anointed, okay? He's, uh, what's some other thing that says about him? Handsome. He's Brandon. handsome. And, a, and, a, and the last thing is the most important. What's the last thing? The Lord, the Lord is with him. Took you have the King James? No, I have the read, 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 read what you have. 18. Then one of the young men said, Behold, I have seen the son of Jesse, the Benjaminite, who is a skillful musician, a mighty man of valor, a warrior, one prudent in speech, and a handsome man, and the Lord is with him. That word, skillful you have, skillful in playing, you have skillful in playing, and what, and what did you have again? Skillful in playing. Skillful. Skillful. Everybody has skillful. Cunning in playing. Cunning. Okay. Is that a King James? Yeah. All right. The word in the King James is cunning. Not that it was written in King James. But the word cunning or skillful, if you go back and read it in the Greek, it means yada. You know what it means? What, what would we think about skillful? That's why, it's, that's why study to show yourself approved. Because when you say skillful in playing, what did you think that would mean? Craftsman. Very good. But, but but playing, I mean, he played instrument. He was very good, right? Uh, smart. What else? Master musician. Okay. You know what the word cunning means? You can look it up in the Greek. In the Hebrew, I'm sorry. This is Old Testament. It says he sees. He knows. What do we read in First John? But you, children of the Lord, you don't. You won't believe a lot because you know the truth. It says David could see and David knew. Okay? That's a picture of what the Lord wants us to realize. When we are following him, we know and we can see. And when you see something, don't doubt it. When God shows you something, my brother-in-law told me one time he just became a Christian. And he was in a church one day and he was on the board. And the guy that was leading the thing, he's looking up like that and he saw horns on the dude's head. Now, he, he's a new Christian. He ain't, he ain't read a bunch of charismatic books and saw all these videos about it. He don't know nothing. All he knows is he's been reading the Word. And he said, I rub my eyes, right? He said, I rub my eyes, and I look back up, and I still saw them. They had horns on his head. Mm -hmm. Don't doubt what the Lord is showing you. That's right. And if you knew that dude, you had no doubt he had horns on his head. But he was leading a whole lot of people. So here we are. So... So David was very cunning. He saw. All right, now I want to go to uh, the, the, the last thing we're going to look at is, is chapter 17 of Samuel, which will be the next page. And we're going to look at the battle of David and Goliath and how we battle the spirit of Antichrist. All right, now the Philistines gathered together their armies for battle. I'm in verse 1. 
Philistines gathered together their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Sokoth, which belongs to Judah. And it came between Sokoth and Azekah in Ephraim's Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered, and encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up a line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain of the other side, with a valley between them. Okay, so what do we have here? We have battle lines drawn up, right? Mm -hmm. And we talked about from the beginning, we, we, what we read in Psalm 9, and we read in Psalm 10, and you know, the, uh, I skipped Ephesians 6, but we know this, it says, for we, you know what it says, for we fight not against flesh and blood, put on the whole armor of God, for we not, fight not against flesh and blood, and I've told y'all that, this, in the, in the Amplified Bible, I think it's, it's, it's the Bible that gets this right. It says, we fight not only against flesh and blood. Because it's evident that we're fighting against flesh and blood. Jesus did it. Paul did it. David did it. Okay, In the end times, we're fighting against a beast. And these antichrists, we said they are men. That's what we said, right? So we are fighting against. But it, what it's saying is, in the, in the, in the end degree, the they're really being controlled by, by what? Spiritual wickedness in high places. They're being, they're, they're puppets on a string. So un undoubtedly, they're being control, controlled by demon spirits. Spiritual wickedness in high places. So we are, we are to do what? What are we to put on? The, armor. the whole armor of God. That we may do what? Stand against spiritual wickedness in the last days. And the first thing we're supposed to put on is a helmet of salvation. What's the helmet protect? Your mind. Okay? What, what does the devil do to your mind? He throws fiery darts into your mind. What's some of the things he throws at you in your mind? What's the number one thing he's throwing at you right now? Fear. Fear. Okay? Fear. Fear. And fear will make you do things that you won't normally do. I, I've seen people right now, I'm telling you right now, they haven't made up their mind to, to trust the Lord. And, and, and it scares me what's happening with the capitulation and what the government's trying to do and try to do things to people right now because, and what are they tying it to? My daughter has to make a decision next month whether she's going to keep her job, okay? This other lady says, you know, if I don't keep this job, I'm going to be living in my car. So if she's living in a car without a job, can she buy food? And the mark of the beast, this is not the mark of the beast, we ain't seen the mark of the beast yet. But I'm telling you, it can't be four off. Sure. We're seeing precursors that are going to be. We're seeing chips. We're seeing injections in hands. We're seeing all these things. We're, it's here. And it's all about uh, reconnaissance and facial recognition and you have been able to. It's about, because we talk, the, the Bible says there's going to be a one world government. A one world global system that will control, as these beasts, y'all. It will control everything. And finally, the mark of this beast will be to control everything that you cannot buy nor sell. That's right. Which means you can't do anything. Right. You can't buy food. You can't buy a car. <clears throat> you can't buy anything. And you can't work. That's selling your labor, right? We work, we sell our labor. Well, I'm sorry, you can't have this job. So you can't buy nor sell. It's already started. Amen? Amen. So, so here we go. We are... Uh, so that's this battle that they're lined up. I'm in verse 4. And there came out of the camp of the Philistines a champion named the life of Gad, whose height was six cubits. Say that with me. Six cubits. Six cubits. And a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he's armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels, and he had a bronze armor on his legs and a javelin, a bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his Spear's head weighed 600 shekels. Say 600. 600. Did you know that these giants, and it tells us in the Bible plainly that his brother, these, but these giants, there's, there's several videos you can watch now about all the giants that were in the land. They had six fingers and six toes. Right. Okay. There's a lot of sixes going on with Goliath and these giants. Yeah. Six, six, six. I really believe he's a spirit of Antichrist. Yeah. Okay. Let's look at what he does. And the shield bearer went before him. And in verse 8, he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. 
If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve him. And the Philistine says, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all the Israelites heard, Israel, Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were, help me out here, dismayed, dismayed greatly and afraid. greatly afraid. It says lost their courage and were terrified. They lost their courage and they were, oh, that's a good one. So this giant comes out and he says, give me a man. We're going to fight. Whoever wins takes all. And it says the armies of Saul were scared to death. Mm -hmm. Okay? What verse are we on? 13, huh? 12. No, 12. Now David was the son of Ephemite of Bethlehem in Judea named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. We're talking about Jesse. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to battle. And names of his three sons who went to battle was Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah. David was the youngest. The three elders' brothers followed Saul, but David went back and forth to Saul to feed his brother's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. 40 days, Goliath came out and made this proclamation. Give me a man and let's fight. Winner takes all. And every day, the reaction from Israel was the same. What was it? Dismay and fear and loss of courage. And how did you say it, Dawn? We're at a terrified. And terrified. Okay. 40 days and 40 nights. What does 40 signify? Mm -hmm. No. 40 is testing. testing. Jesus was in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay. So we have Israel being tested. Okay. God allowing it. Okay. The devil's testing him. Just like the devil tested Jesus in the garden. Right? We have the devil coming out and screaming to the people of God, saying, send me a man. Send me a man. And nobody was, would dare bring it up. All right, what verse are we on? He did, it, he did it in the morning and in the afternoon. Verse 17. And Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp of your brothers. Also take ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they all they and all the men of Israel were in the valley fighting with the Philistine. They really weren't doing much fighting. They were just shaking in their boots. All right. So David's told to go down. Come here, David. I need you to go run me and Aaron. Bring some cheese and some food to your brothers and to the captain of the army. Okay? All right. Verse 20. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. Say that with me. As Jesse, as Jesse had commanded him. Commanded. Jesse had commanded. All right? Remember that. He came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. So when he got there, it's just either the morning or the, ap the afternoon when, this, when the thing is going on with, the, with Goliath. So he gets there. And, uh, and Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle army against the army. And David left the things in the charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. So David drops the cheese off. He runs. He's like, what's going on here? You know, they got a, something happening here. He runs up where his brothers are and he sees this, this giant's going to come out. Okay? He never saw this before, right? He's been with the sheep. All right, what verse we in? Verse we in? 23. 20, 23. As he talked with them, behold, he's talking with his brothers, and behold, the champion Goliath comes out, and, and he spoke the same words as before. And David heard him, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him as they were much afraid. Verse 25. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. You get the daughter, you get the king's daughter, you don't have to, your whole family don't have to pay taxes and you will be made rich. That's whoever, okay? Did anybody take Saul up on his offer? 
Why? Scared. Scared to death. Okay. Terrified. Terrified. Verse 26. And David said to the men who stood by, What shall be done to the man who kills this Philistine? And it says, And the men repeated what he said. Was David hard of hearing? No. No, David knew what they said. What, what I really believe he's saying is, Wait a minute. Wait, wait, say again? Exactly. Thank you, buddy. Why? You, the man who does this gets the king's daughter, he gets rich, and he gets his father's house to be free? And you guys ain't taking up on this? He can't believe it. What verse we on? Say again? 20? 27. Yeah. What, so David said to the men, who shall be, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistines and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistines that he should defy the armies of the living God? What did David do for the first time that nobody else did? He questioned. Yeah. Stood up and questioned. He properly defined the enemy the as what? An enemy of the living God. He's not just an enemy of Saul. He's, he's the enemy of my God. All right? And the people answered him in the same way. They answered him again. So it shall be done to the man who kills him. Now, they see, they see David's getting interested in this. Like he's going to take him, take him up on it. And his brother, his elder brother, in verse 28, his elder brother heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he says, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? What's he doing? He's taunting him. He's, he's what? Trying to discourage, trying to discourage, yeah. He's like, come on, man. He's putting him down. He's like, bro. Okay, look right here. I know. Look, and, and then what he says is, he says, I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. What? Somebody read their version. I know your arrogance and your evil heart. You came down to see the battle. So now, 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 are they not? They not only questioning his motives, they're basically, he's co basically calling him evil, and I mean, he's dogging him to the nth degree, okay? Then David says, and David says, what have I done? Was it not but a word? I want somebody to read their version. What have I now done? Is there not a cause? What have I now done? Say that with me. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Y'all, that's a question we need to ask ourselves. Mine says, what, what it says? What have I done now? Protested David. It was just a question. Okay. The call. But he's, he's, I, I, I love the way, is, is there not a cause? Yeah, is there not a cause? Does it, 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 it not, somebody needs to step up here. Yeah. Is there not, somebody needs to say something here. You may be in a room and somebody may be saying something and the Lord may say, ooh, wait, wait, is there not a cause for you to open your mouth right about now? Yeah. And when you open your mouth, okay, we're going to get to that. Hold on. Well, I'll tell you what, let's get our little papers out. <laughs> Any, what, anybody has an extra little sheet? I got mine. <clears throat> All right, we're going to fill in these blanks. Remember, we're talking about battling the spirit of Antichrist. Verse 17. Verse 17. Somebody read verse 17. <coughs> hmm? And Jesse said to David his son, Take for your brothers an ephod of this parched grain, and these ten loaves, and carry them quickly to the camp of, to your brothers. So what David had to go do? Run an errand. Very important in the world's mind? No. Number one, David was a servant. David was a servant who didn't who didn't look at he was a excuse me, he was a humble servant who did the little things. He served people. Okay? Nobody patted him on the back, you know. Look at the next one. Verse 20. Somebody read verse 20. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep 
with a keeper and took the provisions and went. And Jesse had commanded him. As Jesse has commanded him, David obeyed his father. David obeyed his father. We need to obey our father when he speaks to us and tells us to do something. It may be to bring some cheese somewhere, or it may be to stand up and fight a giant. But we need to obey when he says it. And if we, he tells us, he got our back. Amen? All right, verse 26. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defies the army of the living God? David properly identified the enemy. David properly identified the enemy. The church needs to properly identify its enemies, y'all, and quit bringing the enemies into their camp. And try to be buddy buddy with them. Because we know that there are wolves that will sneak in with sheep with sheep's clothing. There's angels of lights who will come in and, and 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 deceive the people. Okay? We need to properly define the enemy like David did. Verse 28. So Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke, and his anger was kindled against David. When David followed, what his father told him to do, and he gets to the battle, and he feels he feels the unction of the spirit to do something. His own brother did what? Ridiculed, Ridiculed him, mocked him, and condemned him. I want to tell you something. Now. When you listen to your father and your father only, your brothers and a lot of time your leaders will mock you and ridicule you, and and they'll and they'll basically say, "Who are you?" I had guys tell me that, man, who are you, man? Who's following you? I'm like, no, I hope nobody's following me. I, 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 hope, I hope people may follow me as I follow the law. Mm -hmm. But don't follow me. You know, only when I'm, but you know, this whole thing about who's following you or my sheep. I heard people say, oh, well, my sheep. Your sheep. That ain't your sheep. That's God's sheep. God got one. God is the good shepherd. He's the whole shepherd. We may be under shepherds, you know. Here we go. Uh, so, David stood firm even when his closest family ridiculed him. His closest friends, I mean his own brothers ridiculed him. He stood firmly. Verse 29. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? David would not back down. David would not let criticism, he would not let any of these things that they were throwing at him, he would not let him, he would not stop him from doing what he knew he had to do from the Lord. Alright, we go on to verse 33. And David said, so, and so we see now, that now they're going to bring David to Saul because of what he's saying. Alright? Uh, and he turned away from him, I'm in mean, verse 30 toward another, and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him as before. They keep telling them the same thing. Right. And he's like, well, come on, man. Somebody yeah. ain't done this yet. Right. Uh, this. And, then he said, and Saul said, so they bring him to Saul. And he said, don't, verse 32, and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail him. Your servant, your servant, right, will go out and fight with this Philistine. Yep. Don't be scared. I'm going to take care of this. Okay. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. So now he's at, his, he's at the leader's house. Is the leader think David can do anything about this? No. So his own brothers condemn him. His own leader says, bro, you can't do this. Who are you? Huh? Who are you? Who are you? Exactly. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And he rose against me. I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed me. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Okay? Verse 30, 37. And David said, The Lord delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, and he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Verse 38. 
when then Saul clothed David with his armor, he put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail and stood and, and David strapped his sword over his armor and he tried to go in vain for he had not tested them. Okay, so David, David says, I'm going. And Saul said, okay, well, at least let me dress you. Okay, yeah. so he puts this big armor on him. He puts all this stuff on him and David starts walking like, oh, no, this ain't gonna work. This is not how I roll, right? <laughs> I roll with a slingshot and some rocks, okay? And keep so he in says mind, he was head and shoulders taller exactly. than everybody else. Right, right, right. He had some That's some stuff. Right? It's like when you're young and you put on your daddy's clothes. All right. Uh, what verse are we on? So David, so David took them off. Say that with me. David took them off. All right. Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose five small stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistines. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. Verse 42. I mean, verse 42. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. What does your Bible say? He despised, he despised him. What does the enemy think about you? He despises you. He disdains you. For he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said, the Philistine was talking about Goliath now. Yeah. Talking about the Antichrist spirit now. He said to him, Am I a dog? Did you come to me with a stick? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. So the, the Antichrist got his own gods, right? And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. I'm going to make minced meat out of you. But David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. The name of the armies of Israel. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Did he say I come to you as a servant of Saul? No. no he said I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And of the God. And, and of God the armies of Israel. Whom you have defiled. You have defiled God. This day... The Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will and I will strike you down, cut off your head, and I will give the dead <coughs> give the dead bodies of the whole. I'm not just going to do away with you. I'm going to do away with all of these too. David is speaking some prophetic words right here, man. Can you imagine what the soldiers were doing? What is he saying? I mean, they must have been freaking out. <laughs> And I will give the dead bodies to the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts. That all, this is the key, y'all, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Yes. Did he say that everybody can know how great David is? No. I'm the greatest preacher there is. I'm the greatest this and I'm the greatest that. Look at what I got. No, everybody can know there's a God in Israel. There'll be no doubt when this young boy knocks a giant, kills a giant and cuts off his head. Everyone will know there's a God in Israel. Amen. And we know what happened. For, and then he ends with this. He says, for the battle is the Lord's, and the Lord will give you into my hand. For the battle is the Lord's, and the Lord will give you into my hand. We're talking about battle in the spirit of Antichrist. Look at verse uh, 33 and 36. Where and how was David prepared? Why, was David, why did David know he was going to be able to go against this Antichrist giant? Where did this happen? In the, in the tending sheep in the did anybody even know about this? No. He was in obscurity as a little shepherd boy, and he's killing lions and bears. He was doing exploits for God when nobody saw. See, God is preparing us where nobody, where you say like, what, what am I doing for the Lord? You know, I'm over here. I don't have any opportunities like a lot of other people. God's preparing you. By fighting the battles that he's called you to fight, those bears and those lions, he's preparing you to know, because when you go through those victories, you're going to be able to know that when this giant stands up in front of me, he ain't nothing but a lion and a bear. Amen? If God is for us, who or what can be against us? The answer is nothing. Nobody. All right, look at the next one. How was, how was David prepared for this battle? He killed a lion and he fought the bear. 
Verse 42. How was David seen in his enemy's eyes? We talked about that. How did the enemy see David? He despised him. We got to we got to realize the spirit of antichrist that's in the world today, that's real and is all around us, hates us, despises us, don't like us. Okay. You skip 38, 39. 38, 39. What did David not allow? 38, 39. Oh, thank you, brother. He did not allow Saul to dress him. Do not let man dress you. Do not let another man dress you. Let go with what the Lord has given you. You know, I see so many people, they, they're so identified. And, you, and remember this, that's how Goliath identified the armies of Israel. He says, you servants of Saul. That's how he saw them, as servants of Saul. David came in and changed all of that. And he's like, well, you ain't messing with a servant of Saul right here. You're messing with a servant of God right here. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and Saul, who the men served, I'm telling you right now, I see so, so many people I talk to. Well, you know, Pastor so and so. I, okay, that's great. But what's God telling you? Are you listening to God? Huh? You know what I'm talking about? Okay? If Pastor so and so is a wolf in sheep's clothes, you're going to be in a bad, bad way. And it could be possible. Okay? So you better know what God's telling you. So do not let man dress you. Let God dress you. And this is what I have right here. David was a shepherd, right? Okay? And, you know, uh, Brother Neil put my first video that we put up. He put it up for me. And he thank you. He did a great job. And he put Pastor Mike Fusilier. And I called him. I said, Neil, I, I don't, I don't, I don't. Go tight, and he, he couldn't take it off because it was just too, too tough. I said, he said, I won't do it again. I understand what you know. That's my, that's my conviction. Now, if somebody don't have that conviction, that's my. I'll tell you why. Because as I said, there's not one title in the whole New Testament. Do I believe I function as a pastor? Yes, I do. But it's, it simply means shepherd. Pastor simply means shepherd. So what do shepherds do? They tend sheep. That's all they do. And this is what the Lord showed me. Uh, this is like three characteristics of a shepherd. I think of a good shepherd. Sometimes they're crude. Sometimes they stink. And they throw rocks at the enemy. My three characteristics of a shepherd. They can be crude. They can stink. And they throw rocks at the enemy. That was David's characteristics. Amen? That's how supposed to be. Huh? That's supposed to be. Look at the last one. So how was David seen in the enemy's eyes? He was seen as despised. Verse 45, what did David know? David knew that this enemy was the Lord's enemy. And that David, David knew that the battle was the Lord's. This is how we fight our battles. This is how we fight our battles. Verse 47, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with a sword and a spear, for the battle is the Lord, and he will give you into my hands. What, what did David have that we need? David had the courage and the knowing to know who God was, who he was in God, and to know that the battle is the Lord's. And I really believe that we're going to see, we're seeing the, the you know, Bible said, as in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. I really believe the book of Daniel with Daniel in the lion's den is a picture. Because think about this. When David, when David killed the giant and ran up to him and cut off his head, what happened to the armies of Israel? The armies of Israel. They, all of a sudden they had full of courage. And what happened to the Philistines? They were running. So David's, David's Courage was infectious, okay? And his prophecy came true. So we need to have, we need some Davis to stand up and give some people some courage. Sometimes we may just take one little voice to stand up and say, you know, there was a, a Kurkeshchu in one of the European countries. He was a, he was a brutal dictator. 
And he's up there, him and his wife, and they got the thousands of, it wasn't Poland, it might have been in Ukraine, one of those things where they ruled these people so violently. And, and he, he was up there, and they, it's kind of like a Hitler deal, right? And they just control the people. And he starts to talk, and one old lady screams out, you're a liar. And it says you could hear a pin drop. And they're like, what? What did she say? And she says it again. She screams it. You're a liar. And then all of a sudden, a man on the other side yells, yes, you're a liar. And then all of a sudden, somebody else. And, and the people began to, in unison, and you know what happened that day? They took that man and his wife and they hung him. Because they were evil despots. But what did they take? It took one little lady to have some backbone and some strength to declare the truth, to properly define reality and say, no, 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 you're lying. You're a liar. We need to stand up to, to fake news and say, you're lying. You're outright lying. And tell the people that don't know. You know, I met people, well, I'm not watching the news anymore. I don't want to hear what's going on. Well, you can, we can stick our heads in the sand. That's what we want to do. But it ain't going to change what's going on around us. Right. We need to properly define reality and point out truth and, and point out error and point out lies. Amen? Amen? We need to be David's because the spirit of Antichrist is here. It was there in John's day and it's here ever so strongly because the Antichrist is not far off. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Father God, I just thank you for your mercy and your grace. Yes. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you called us to follow. We know that David ultimately is Jesus because he fought the battle one-on-one. -on -one. He fought the giant, which is the devil, and he won the battle for all of Israel. We know that David is you, Jesus, but we are in you. We are in Christ Jesus. You've called us to speak out. You've called us to put on the full armor of God. You've called us to stand up courageously and not be afraid, and not be afraid. So, Father, I thank you that as we read your word, that you speak to us, and you just show us, Lord God, that we can have the same courage that David had. That we know that the battle is not ours, but the battle is you, is, is yours. And we can stand up before any enemy, any giant, and declare, you may come to me with all these weapons, these earthly <coughs> weapons, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. And when I'm finished, through you, the world will know that there's a God in heaven. So, Father, we thank you for what you're going to do in us, through us. We ask that you give us courage and that you... you we remember those words in Daniel that the kingdom of the Most High will be granted to the saints because the Ancient of Days is coming and you're going to make that happen. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let me get the girl. Come on, girl. I think we're in for a treat.